Welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. All right, everyone, I am on the line with David Duvino. David is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. David, welcome back to the Twimble AI podcast. Thank you, Sam. It's nice to be back. It is great to catch up with you. I'm really looking forward to this. You have been super busy since the last time we spoke, which was back in January of 2018, so just about two years ago, or at least that's when we published the show. We might have actually caught up a little bit before then, but that show was on composing graphical models with neural networks, and you've been uh, quite prolific since then, and we will hopefully get a chance to talk about a bunch of what you've been up to. I'll refer folks back to that show for your full background and how you got started in machine learning. But why don't we start out by having you share a little bit about your current research interests? So yeah, obviously one big thing that's happened since two years ago is that we started working on differential equations a lot. And we had the first paper, you know, the neural ODEs paper and We've just actually released it. And, and I'll just uh, interrupt you to say that was a huge paper last year. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. a. This was NeurIPS 2018 yep. uh, where that paper was presented. And you've been on my list. We actually did try to catch up around that time, but you were you were super busy. And uh, we'll talk about it this time. OK, great, great, great. There's a lot of, I think, pretty interesting follow ups. I'm trying to not let that take over all the research that happens here, but or at least among my students. But uh, we just published a follow up, which I'm really happy about, where we figured out how to train stochastic differential equations in a scalable, scalable way. And that was actually really surprising that it hadn't been worked out before. It was one of these things where I thought, oh, you know, when we looked at ordinary differential equations, the basic math for how to efficiently do backprop through them was already known in the numerics community. So I assumed that, you know, SDs have been around almost as long and it would have been worked out. But actually, it hadn't. And there was sort of, a few, there was things called like backwards SCEs and um, a few other approaches for trying to to build the same sorts of algorithms for doing uh, grading based training of SCEs, but none of them were scalable. And I think it's one of these things where the uh, differential equations community typically hasn't been focused on computational efficiency. Uh, so the idea is that you know showing that there exists these dynamics is like that had been worked out what the dynamics were, but how to do these things efficiently hadn't been. So I teamed up with a probabilist here at University of Toronto, Leonard Wong, and an amazing uh, undergrad who's now a Google Brain resident, Joy Chen Li. And uh, we worked out all the details. And you know they're the ones who really did the mathematical heavy lifting. And I just sort of <laughs> convinced them that there, there had to exist a, a simple algorithm, or rather an efficient <laughs> algorithm. Because for everything else that people have looked at, there's always um, backpropagation always has the same asymptotic time complexity as the forward pass. And this was one area where it, people sort of thought, oh, maybe it's not the case that there is such a efficient reverse algorithm. And we eventually worked out what it was. So I'm really happy about that. I feel like we're just diving into yeah, yeah. the neural ODE stuff. And we'll circle back to maybe uh, how all of the different things your lab works on kind of connect uh, together. But for the neural ODE stuff, let's just start from the beginning, I am sure there are folks that are listening that don't really understand what a differential equation is. So yeah, and the funny thing is that I had actually never learned these in undergrad. Like I never took one of these courses on ODEs. Um, oh really? Yeah, I just kind of picked it up, um, you know, from talking to people who knew about them and reading about them. It's almost good. So if you take a course on under on ODEs, at least the ones that I've looked at, most of the material is based around solving them exactly for special cases. So if you have like linear ODE or some sort of uh, structure in a second order ODE, there exists special cases where the answer is like sine or cosine or X or something like that. Mm -hmm. And most, of, I think most often, or at least when I encountered them in undergrad, it was the the context that were was provided was typically like physical systems, like physics mm -hmm. or, you know, the relationships between things in the, the physical world are, you know, often governed by uh, these differential equations. Yeah, yeah, that's where they typically come from. And that's actually another big difference is that the numerics community is used to looking at differential equations that are given by nature. And they have to work out, how am I going to solve these equations? I can't choose which ones I want to solve. I have to solve the ones that, that are there. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I want to kind of talk about a bit later is that 
when we use neural networks to specify these differential equations, it's actually a pretty different game because we think that there's many different sets of dynamics that will encode the same, or that will roughly solve the, the problem. So we can maybe try to choose dynamics that are easy to solve that give almost the same answer as like the very best dynamics that might be really hard to solve. Help us frame out the, the problem that you're trying to solve with this line of work. Is it <laughs> uh, solving a differential equation? Like you have a given differential equation and you're trying to, what exactly are you trying to do? Sure. So that's a great question because there is some work on trying to use neural networks to solve differential equations. And we're not really doing that. Um, although I do want to mm -hmm. mention that one place where I did learn a lot about these was actually when I visited Philip Hennig, who's an amazing researcher at the Max Planck Institute. When I was a PhD student, I did an internship with him in Germany for one summer. And we worked on a project where we were trying to, or we, well, where he had worked out this correspondence between the standard ODE solvers called like Runge Kuda methods and probabilistic models that like, well, Gaussian processes that would extrapolate what these functions would do in the future, given observations about their gradients in the present. Uh, so basically, people had come up with Runge Kuda algorithms by asking how could we extrapolate in such a way that all these errors cancel out. And then he realized that actually you can derive these automatically by just putting a Gaussian process prior on these functions. And then if you ask what the predictive posterior looks like, it actually gives you these Runge Kuda algorithms for free. Um, anyway, but the point is that all this work on neural IDs is not actually focused on building better solvers. We're saying let's inherit all these amazing solvers that the numerics community has built and just try to repurpose them to, to train even bigger models than people normally have before. And you know, from a technical point of view, all of the tricks in the neural ODEs paper were uh, like already existed in the numerics literature. Uh, we just put them all together in one place. And so when you say train even bigger models, meaning you're trying to come up with algorithms that are either alternatives to gradient descent or enhancements to gradient descent that facilitate converging on different weights for neural networks that the networks themselves are solving arbitrary problems problems that don't necessarily have to do with differential equations? Oh, that's a great question. So what I mean specifically is let's find efficient ways to compute gradients of like predictive loss or some sort of training loss with respect to all the parameters of some differential equations. And then use standard uh, training algorithms like Adam or whatever in, in the standard ways on the standard losses. And so, you know, when we think of a, a, a gradient, the way that that's typically described is it's a slope, which, um, you know, is a, a differential equation in a sense. Um, and so you're applying these methods to identify these gradients more quickly? Well, yeah. So it's, it's, it's pretty Am confusing because there's because almost every question you ask about could we use ODEs to compute gradients or gradients to solve ODEs, like the answer is always yes. And so there's a lot of different <laughs> ways that these tools combine <laughs> and different people are okay. working on different aspects of the problem. So okay. to be precise, uh, we're saying people have often like um, parameterized differential equations based on some few parameters and, and like simple functions to maybe specify like, you know, how planets evolve or how chemical concentrations change. And then they call ODE solvers to, to run these forward and, and find what the trajectories of these systems look like. Then sometimes they want to fit those systems to data, which requires computing the gradient of the training loss, like the mismatch between the predictions of your model and the data, back through these ODE solutions to the parameters that specify them. So those were the in the neural ODE paper, we, we basically imported all the tricks from the numerical community into one algorithm and said, oh, this is a scalable way to compute gradients where we can use the like fanciest ODE solvers that also the numerics community developed. So it's really, okay. it really kind of just showcasing a bunch of things that the numerics community knew and putting them all together um, in such a way that it would scale to very large systems. Got it. And so what I, what I heard you just say was that you kind of people have in the numerics community have, um, you know, long studied, you know, how to, kind of do the, you know, forward projection of differential equations to trajectories of physical things. And then they want to do kind of the backwards uh, reconciliation so that they can determine how accurate their predictions are. And they're 
were a bunch of different techniques or are a bunch of different techniques for doing that. And what's the relationship between, you know, all of that and neural networks? Did you then pull those into like a a deep learning or neural network framework for doing this backward gradient calculation? Yeah. So there's a few different ways we can use these tools. And one of them is to fit these physical systems that people have been doing. But what was, I think, most, most exciting to the whole deep learning community was to say, oh, there's also a potential that this sort of network, this sort of ODE network could replace some of the the backbone of the the neural networks that we use to train today. So in particular, residual networks is like the standard way you build a very deep network. And Mm -hmm. it's just um, adding together the contributions of a whole bunch of small neural network layers. And so the connection that we talked about in the neural ODE's paper, which had been made before, um, was, oh, well... If you ask, if you look at how one of these ODE solvers um, solves or like computes one of these long trajectories, it also adds up many different calls to these smaller functions. The only thing that we really did knew was to sort of take this really seriously and say, okay, let's actually then use ODE solvers to solve or to compute the answer of our neural network. And then it can decide, you know, how many function evaluations to make and where. Um, and yeah, so that was the, the new part. And so this has a few advantages. It's it's kind of a different way of formulating the problem. Instead of saying, here's the algorithm for computing my residual network, which is like, you know, chain together 100 layers. We say, here's the dynamics of this trajectory. Uh, ODE solver, it's, up, it's your job to figure out how many times and we need to evaluate this function and where to tell me what the exact, or to approximate what the exact trajectory would be. So the cool thing is that if the problem is easy, it might only need a few uh, calls to the function. And if it's hard, it might need a lot. But this is something that's sort of being uh, determined adaptively on the fly instead of at training time, where normally right now people have to just sort of try different depths. They say, oh, I I trained a uh, neural network with, you know, 10 layers. It didn't do as good as one with 20. I, you know, it started doing better uh, and better the more I added, but then everything was too expensive. So I had to, uh, to cap it. The hope is that we can now say, oh, let's at training time, let the, like, just tell our optimizer, here's my trade off between accuracy and speed. It's up to you to figure out how to like uh, trade these things off. So, so that was something we sort of said you might be able to do, or rather, this idea of at training time trading off accuracy and speed is something that we, you know, thought we could do, but we we didn't really work out how to do it. And but this is one of the papers that I was up late last night working on for submitting to ICML. Was me and <laughs> my since then me and me and, me and my student uh, Jesse Pettencourt, also working with an undergrad uh, Jacob Kelly and my friend at Google Matt Johnson. We were saying, oh, well, maybe we can add some sort of term, some sort of regularizing term to the loss that makes the dynamics easy to solve. And so we got that to work. And now we can say, oh, there's this trade off that we can explore between ha- having training a ODE network that exactly minimizes our training loss versus one that is cheap to solve and sort of requires few, fewer layers. And mm-hmm. so now, you know, if depending on your compute budget, you can just move along this Pareto front and trade these things off however you want. Nice, nice. And that was the neural networks with – no, that's not the neural yeah. networks with cheap – This is unpublished stuff. This is, this is an unpublished paper that was just submitted uh, February 7th in the wee hours of the morning exactly. for the upcoming yeah. ICML uh, conference. Exactly. It doesn't get any hotter off the press than that. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. And, and is it already up on archive or? No, it's not on archive. Although uh, Jesse gave a talk about it at the uh, program transformation workshop at NREPS. Um, although it wasn't working at that point. We were just sort of saying, here's the math that we're going to try to implement. And so is this related to the cheap differential operators paper? Uh, sort of. So the cheap differential operators paper, again, that was actually Ricky's idea. He just sort of came to me and said, hey, I think we can actually constrain the dynamics of our neural networks such that these quantities that we need to compute are, are cheap. So the, the motivation from that was there was a follow-up to the neural ODE's paper called uh, Fjord, uh, well that, or the name of the method was Fjord, and it basically said um, we can build normalizing flows out of, like in continuous time, using ordinary differential equations. So normalizing flows are a family of density estimators, which is just means you know a generic way to model any data in an unsupervised way that work by taking a simple density like a Gaussian and somehow warping it into some non-Gaussian complicated parametric density. Um, And so one of the nice follow-ups from the neural ODE stuff was saying, oh, it turns out that if you 
think of this transformation happening continuously, then the math that you need to compute the change in density is a little bit nicer. So it goes from having to compute the determinant of the Jacobian <laughs> of the dynamics to just the trace of the Jacobian of the dynamics. And that's actually a lot easier to approximate. So it's still expensive though, and it's still kind of a downside of this method. So uh, Ricky worked out that actually, if we constrain the architecture of these dynamics networks, we can give them exact trace, we can compute their traces exactly. And this is, I kind of like it. So I want to talk about engineering neural network architectures. So there's a lot of work that is has been totally foundational to the field where people sort of do trial and error and they say, oh, what if I add more layers here? What if I change the nonlinearities in my network? What if I you know, add noise here or there? And sometimes these are well motivated. Theoretically, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's just sort of you know the trial and error that we need to get any technology to work. Right. I think in the first year of my podcast, there was this period where many of my conversations were you know, asking, okay, how is this done? How are people doing? And the answer that uh, I finally came to understand was that it was just trial and error and, you know, graduate student descent was the the term thrown around. And uh, a lot of the, you know, the great models that we use uh, to, you know, solve problems then and now, like came out of this, you know, just iterative exploratory process. Yeah. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's more satisfying when we can say, oh, I want to have a network with that's going to learn functions with this property. Therefore, I know that I need that my network has this architecture or that, or saying if it has this architecture, it'll, it'll definitely be able to learn functions that enforce this property, like maybe some sort of invariance. Um, so there was some really nice work on this called deep sets, which said, what if I want to have a network that takes in a set of things and gives me an answer that doesn't depend on the order of the things in that set? Because that's sort of mm -hmm. what makes it a set is that the order shouldn't matter. But on a computer, you do have to give things in a particular order uh, so sometimes people just fudge it and they randomize the order. But these guys worked out the math to say, oh, here's the family of architectures that will always be invariant to the order of things in a set. So I really liked that work. Um, and then I liked Ricky's idea because it was the same sort of thing saying, okay, well, we know we want our networks to have this property. Here is this sort of the general way. Here's the general trade-off where we can say we have to make this sacrifice, but then we will achieve this nice property. And we can actually interpolate between networks that are, let's say, very restricted, but give you exact traces, or ones that are less restricted, but then you have to approximate the trace. And the trace corresponds only to the cost of determining the weights, or is oh, the trace yeah. <laughs> um, more fundamental or, or yeah, so, <laughs> have broader implications? Yeah, I wish we had a whiteboard, but, but when I say trace, <laughs> I mean the some of the diagonal terms in the Jacobian of these networks. Right. And so the Jacobian is just the matrix that says, what is the gradient of all the outputs of the network with respect to all of its inputs? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's just one quantity that we sometimes need to quant uh, evaluate, but it's actually quite expensive to evaluate it exactly for, for standard neural networks. So you're able to, by fixing the network architecture, fixing the trace uh, to be easier to compute does you know is characterizing the trace in that way is it just an issue of computational complexity or does the trace have other implications on you know the network or its performance or its characteristics just an issue of computational complexity uh yeah quote unquote <laughs> right <laughs> no, yeah that's a great question um so i think one very valid question that people ask is basically saying, okay, well, how does the trade-off look empirically? Like where along this curve should I go? What does this restriction actually mean in practice? And mm -hmm. in this initial paper, all we basically did was lay out the trick and show that it worked in a bunch of settings. Um, okay. But I think that's a great question. We we know that this restriction hurts the expressive capacity. Or, yeah, we know that this restriction hurts the expressive capacity of these networks, but we haven't characterized in exactly what way. So, that's a great okay. question, and I wish I knew the answer. All right, cool. And then uh, another paper that you presented at, or that your team worked on at uh, this last NeurIPS was the latent ODEs for irregularly sampled time series. Uh, how does that one tie into this uh, body of work? Well, that's that one was kind of satisfying because it was the, reg the original motivation for looking at ODEs in the first place was uh, Yulia, who's the first author of that paper and the well, second, but co-first author of the Neural ODEs paper. 
was working on some medical applications where we had some gene assays that, of, of people's tumors that were evaluated at like, you know, uh, a week apart and then a month apart and then maybe another week apart and then a year apart. Mm. And it's not quite clear how to fit that sort of data into a standard recurrent neural network or something like that. So that m made us look at these continuous time models in the first place. But then we wrote the neural ODE paper, which didn't, it just had proof of concept. It just said, oh, here's something you can do. We, we, look, we explored on toy data. So I think academics, including myself, have a bad habit of taking an applied problem, uh, saying, oh, if we solve this theoretical thing, we could tackle this applied problem, write a paper about solving the theoretical thing and never go back to the problem. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we, we still haven't applied it to the original data set that Yulia was looking at, but we did apply it in that paper to a standard medical records data set where it's like people in the intensive care unit and there's all sorts of different measurements being made of them from different people at different times, like what is their temperature or their blood pressure or whatever. And being able to combine this all into one model uh, is something that's not very natural for the discrete time models we normally use. So we sort of showcase that, yeah, once you have continuous time, here's the set of architectures you can explore and the advantages and yeah, it worked. It was it was a satisfying paper to write. What what is the role that the this continuous time you know versus uh, these irregularly sampled time series played in the original paper? Was it a big motivator or just a side note? You know, it, given this machinery, we can probably tackle this continuous time problem uh, differently. Yeah. So it was the original thing that maybe start to revisit these. Uh, models, but then in the paper, it ended up being secondary. I think in, in most people's eyes, who are just interested in supervised learning, right? Like the bread and butter of the machine learning community is like, I want to train a giant classifier or something. And so, <laughs> the, you know, so we put that front and center because we knew that would be a lot of broader interest. But the okay. thing is that until we make <laughs> neural ODEs faster, or at least as fast as standard uh, architectures, I don't think people are going to. Uh, like, I don't think people should use them. And so that's that's why that motivated the, the work with Jesse on regularizing them, regularizing them to be fast. We're still at the proof of concept stage there. We just got it working in some you know standard MNIST sort of things. But right now, I am really excited about the time series uh, setting for two reasons. So one is that it's really right now one of the main areas where you definitely do need a continuous time model, or rather, you definitely need differential equations. There's if you start talking about continuous time, you're basically already said you're using differential equations. Like, I don't want to go and shoehorn differential equations in where they don't actually make sense empirically or practically uh -huh. just because it's like a cool thing. Um, and so the other thing is that I think the... What is it about continuous time uh, models or problems that necessitates uh, differential equations? Oh, well, you need to be able to say how the system changes for any arbitrarily small amount of time. And so mm -hmm. once you've done that, you the, the only way to do that is to basically describe the derivatives of the state. Um, there, mm -hmm. there, like maybe so in like discrete time, you you the relationship is between you know something happening at time n and something happening at time n plus one. Exactly. Uh, whereas with continuous time, you need a a continuous function to, to relate things happening at different times, and if that's the case. Uh, you hope that it's differentiable. <laughs> yeah, or rather, if it is a continuous function that says how the thing changes, then that meets the definition of a differential equation as, as far as I'm concerned. Like maybe there could be some got it, got thing, it. But, um And the funny thing is that I think the business community and like the medical community have been, I think, kind of hilariously underserved by the machine learning community in the sense that almost all the data sets that they, like when I talk to the sponsors of Vector or people at like big companies, they say, okay, so my data looks like I have a bunch of interactions with my customer that happen over years and they're irregularly sampled and they're different types of observations. And I want to be able to predict, um, I want to be able to model this data and deal with the fact that it's like all missing or almost all missing almost all the time. How do I do this? And I say, well, I mean, I guess you could kind of shoehorn it into an RNN maybe like binning data. There's some nice work on deep common filters by David Sontag and some other people um, mm -hmm. at NYU and MIT that said, okay, if you move things to discrete time, here's how to deal with missing data. But it's really just like the bread and butter of like most of industry doesn't, like their data sets just don't fit with what's coming out of uh, most machine learning labs who are more, more focused on things like video or audio or text where you really can say that there's an observation at every time step. Well, a lot of times don't we just throw away the 
sequential nature of the problem and just treat each individual sample as uh you know, unrelated training data drawn from a distribution? Oh, yeah. You, that's one of the ways that you can force the data to match your model. And I guess I'll just say, you know... But the point being that you... Yeah, if actually there's a, some some sequence there, you're throwing away information. And and what this is doing is proposing a way to take advantage of that information, yet still be tractable. Yeah, exactly. We want to meet the data where it lives. Um, I think... <laughs> In the future, when like statisticians should take some sort of Hippocratic oath where they swear not to just like destroy data, um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, a lot of data is not particularly valuable. But the point is, I see oftentimes, including you know, in my own work, if we don't have the tools, then you just say, okay, well, we have to throw away a bunch of data, and it we're already crippling our ability to make good predictions when we do that step. So that's kind of how I uh-huh. view, like maybe not just my recent research, but how the field moves in general is how do we get closer and closer to the raw sensors and put more and more of the modeling problem into the hands of one giant model that's jointly looking at everything instead of a sequence of people who are each looking at their little piece and throwing away what they think isn't necessary. So we've talked about the cheap differential operators paper. We've talked about the irregularly irregularly sampled time series paper. There's a paper, Residual Flows for Invertible Generative Modeling. Is that the Residual Flows paper that we talked about, or is that a different Residual Flows Uh, paper? Yes, that's confusing. So that's a different Residual Flows paper. And and it's kind of funny because, so we had this follow-up to the Neural Odys paper called Fjord, which was the continuous time uh, version. And the cool thing about that was that it let you use totally unrestricted neural network architectures. So I was talking before about how sometimes you can restrict the architecture to allow you to have some nice property. So that's what the normalizing flows community did from about 2015 to 2019. There's like real NDP, flow, all these big models where they said, oh, if we restrict our architecture, we can compute the change in density cheaply. Um, But then it's kind of hard to figure out how to make these restrictions without requiring a a whole bunch of layers. And and these models end up being very deep and very expensive uh, to train. And so we said, oh, if you have going to continuous time, you can just use any network architecture and it's fine. But then a couple of years ago, uh, Jorn Jacobson and uh, Jens Behrman came to the Vector Institute and were thinking about the same problems. And they said, okay, well, Fjord is great, but you know, people don't like to have an ODE solver inside of their model. And I think that's a reasonable thing to not want because now you have to fiddle, you have to worry about some numeric issues. You have to choose a, an error tolerance. There are similar issues with like floating point, but not as bad. Anyway, and they worked out, they said, okay, well, what if we use the same math, but uh, for discrete time, could we come up with some version of Fjord that actually used standard neural network network architectures and fixed numbers of of layers and the sort of standard way of setting things up that that everyone's comfortable with, but inherited some of the nice mathematical properties. And then they they did work it out and found, and basically worked out over the course of these two papers, another way to get an unbiased estimate of the change in density, but for finite time discrete flows. So it's kind of funny because it's like this detour into continuous time led to a better discrete time model. Mm-hmm. And that's the invertible generative modeling paper? Uh, yeah, well, there's two. One of them, it was called, the newer one was called residual flows. And then the first one was called invertible resonance. Uh, yeah, and maybe okay. we're polluting the, the namespace with all these like minor variations. <laughs> I may have missed that. What is the uh, review, the invertible characteristic for me? Oh, well, so one thing. What, what is that saying? Yeah. So what that means is that if I have two different possible inputs to my network, um, they won't ever map to the same output. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you want to use the change of variables formula, you need to make sure that you never take the original density and somehow like um, tear it or squish it into a point all of these things cause sort of infinities in the in the likelihood. It makes me think of like a, a some kind of hash relationship. Is there anything interesting there? Yeah, maybe you that... could say we want to avoid a hash, we want to write a hash function that avoids collisions. I mean, the thing is, we don't necessarily want to scramble our density, but yeah, we definitely do want to control when we lose information in these networks. Because uh, if we ever lose destroy information, then we can't use this this change of variable formula. And are, are you also saying that networks that are thus characterized, if given a prediction, you can go back to the original inputs? 
Is it, is it that invertible? Yeah. Or yeah. Is... So it's the same, when we say an invertible function, uh, it's the same, like in one dimensional, like if I say, for instance, f of x equals x. Okay, that's a silly example. Okay, f of right. x equals well, three times x. Square root that's, and square, for example. Yeah, so square is not invertible. And Well, that's not square invertible because of the signs. Right, right. But okay, square root is invertible on on the in the positive reals. Square is not invertible because you can square the positive number or the negative number and get the same answer. Right, yeah. right. It's a little bit uh, getting into the weeds, but basically <laughs> the residual networks mean that we can use any architecture we want to train normalizing flows. And this is in contrast to the previous methods like Glow and Real MVP that had to restrict the architecture. And so the remaining of the four papers that you had at NeurIPS is efficient graph generation with graph recurrent attention networks. Yeah. Is that also related to the this ODE thread no, or is that no, and, off on its own? No, and that was uh, really, you know, one of the papers that, well, it was driven mainly by the first author, Renji Lau, um, who's okay. amazing. and. There's been a sort of race uh, once people said, oh, you know, we could build generative models over graphs to try to make them scale. And again, it's related to this question of how do we enforce some invariance? So people are always trying to say, well, the funny thing about a graph is that the order of the nodes doesn't matter. And this is sort of the mm -hmm. central, this makes a lot of things hard because if we, like graph isomorphism is a standard um, sort of known to be harder than polynomial time Oh. I think it might have just been recently shown to be in some sort of like quasi polynomial time. Anyway, uh, it was thought to be hard for a long time. I forget the exact complexity class it's in, um, which is given two graphs, like a list of nodes and edges, term determine whether they're the same graph. That's that's not trivial. So we want to make sure that our models of graphs also don't care about the ordering. And so we were building on some work recently that said, oh well, there was a lot of progress being made, sort of by just ignoring the problem to some extent and saying, well, let's just choose unordering, and as long as we can assign high likelihood to like one of the many orderings that matches the data, that's probably good enough. And uh, so people uh, like Will Hamilton now at McGill was using recurrent neural networks to gradually iteratively add one node to the graph as we generate them. And he was sort of using recurrent ne networks both at each node addition and then <laughs> within each uh, iteration of node addition, he went over the existing nodes in the graph in a fixed order with another RNN. So it was kind of like an RNN within an RNN. So completely uh, breaking this order invariance like, tw like twice over. And then what Renji basically did in that paper says, oh, we actually only have to break it once. We have to choose an if order for the node. If we use attention? Uh, if we use graph neural networks. The, the great thing about graph neural networks is that their answer doesn't depend on the order of the nodes in the graph. Those were the papers that you uh, you had at NeurIPS. Uh, more broadly, the this neural ODE thing is just kind of one of many things that you're focused on in your lab. You know, I've got a list of those here: automatic chemical design oh. using generative models. <laughs> yeah. That is sounds more applied than anything that we've talked about thus far. Yeah, maybe that's a little old. I mean, that was stuff that I did mostly in my postdoc um, at Harvard. Oh, really? I'm working okay. with uh, Alan Asperuguzic, who He's really taken the mantle on that one, and now he actually moved to Toronto shortly okay. after I did. Well, maybe I should just abandon this list and let you uh, pop it up a level and tell okay. us what are some of the other cool things you're excited about. Yeah. Or did you publish on everything you were excited about at NeurIPS? Oh, no, no. Yeah, I still got, <laughs> still got lots of stuff in the pipeline, lots of stuff I still don't even understand well enough to publish on. But it, mm. one thing I'm kind of starting to appreciate now as an academic in my like fourth year of being a professor is that once you're known for one thing, the incentive to just double down on that one thing are enormous. And it's kind of, you know, like when a band like releases an album, but it has a different sound than the old one. Everyone's like, well, wait, I thought you were going to talk about that other <laughs> line of work. But I'm really trying to resist the the incentives to uh, pigeonhole myself just because in the really long run, you know, things change. We have to keep an open mind. So the general area that I've been excited about for a few years, but it, it's really hard to make progress on is, let's say, learning to search. So I just taught a grad topics course on this last term as a way, grad topics courses are a great way to get a feel for an area and cover all the recent papers and get some students to start projects. And it, it totally worked out. Um, so actually, and a lot of people at DeepMind have been working on or publishing similar or ideas along this vein. It, it sounds like a kind of mashup between meta-learning and uh, neural architecture search. Is that kind of the direction? Yeah, maybe those are related things. I mean, the basic idea is that we have algorithms like 
Monte Carlo Tree Search that now we're starting to understand how to um, embed in other hard machine learning problems, in particular inference and planning. So the idea is that most of what reinforcement learning has done or meta learning just says, oh, yeah, I'll just sort of brute, sor- brute force uh, try to learn a policy that does the right thing in every situation. It has a giant lookup table of when you're in this situation, uh, you should take this action. And that works mm-hmm. if you can train the policy, but it's really expensive and it requires it puts a lot of strain on this one neural network, this policy. And you know, I think most people agree that what humans do is they have this hybrid approach where they say, well, I know roughly what to do, but whenever I realize I'm in a tough or novel situation, I'm going to stop and plan. And I'm going to think, imagine a few steps ahead. Uh, what would happen if I did this? What would happen if, it, if I do that? And then evaluate what I like that outcome. And so doing a little bit of search on the day uh, when you need to make a decision in your mind, takes a lot of pressure off the policy and makes you a much more powerful agent without having to, in your head, prepare for every possible contingency ahead of time. And so, like, nothing I'm saying is, like, new or groundbreaking. I'm just saying that now we finally have the tools to, to build such systems, and there's been a lot of mm-hmm. cool work um, coming out of DeepMind in this way. One paper that I feel like is waiting to be written is about intrinsic motivation or curiosity. So there's all these papers talking about, oh, you know, how is it that people somehow know not to, to not just pursue their goal directly, but also try to learn and do some exploration or stuff. Maybe something, something evolution, something, something like the value of randomness. <laughs> um, and it kind of, so I think these papers are making sensible technical suggestions, but the philosophical sort of speculation about why is this curiosity necessary and making it sound like this mysterious thing bugs me because if you just say, I am going to have to solve a task, but I don't know exactly what it is yet, or I don't know exactly what the dynamics of my environment are, then the optimal plan will include doing some exploration, some learning, practicing skills. Um, so in particular, if we formalize this as a, a POMDP, partially observable Markov decision process, this is like the bread and butter of reinforcement learning since like the 70s. We, we can't solve these because it's too expensive, but if we could, we, all these behaviors would emerge auto- automatically. And I'm, it's not clear to me how much other people agree with me about this, because for a long time I thought I was the only one who thought this. But then when I started to talk to some other, and, and I thought that probably because the motivations of these curiosity papers didn't seem to understand this point. But then when I talked to some of the serious RL people that I know, they're like, oh yeah, of course, yes. Um, that's, I totally agree. So, you know, it's, 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 that's reassuring. It's also kind of sad because you want to be the one guy with the idea that no one else realizes, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, right now we, we can't scale up these amortized planning algorithms to do effective exploration in really tricky domains. Like what you'd like is if you put your agent in a gym and you said, you know, you're going to have to play a game tomorrow. I'm not going to tell you what. It would, you know, learn to dribble a basketball or like, you know, pick up the soccer ball and learn to kick it or, you know, just mm-hmm. invent games that it might have to play and then invent practice drills for itself to learn the dynamics of how it could, how it should play them. And I think that's, there's no uh, remaining foundational problems there, but there's just a lot of engineering problems for which we have now promising tools to tackle those. Yeah, as a researcher, how do you approach engineering problems? And do you, do you approach them differently uh, than an engineer might? Or, you know, is it about framing them? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I would say the one of the, the blessings and the curse of this job that really feels like a blessing most of the time is that I don't spend a lot of time engineering, and I, I really like getting my hands dirty and coding up to the point of a proof of concept, but mm-hmm. it is a bit of a slog to get these things to work. Um, mm-hmm. And my students are amazing at, at that. Um, it's been said of uh, my student, Will Grothwell, that he can get a potato to get state-of-the-art on CIFAR 100 if he has to. Um, <laughs> I mean, and of course, you don't want the engineering skill to be the determiner of which method ends up looking best in your paper. And, you know, we take that seriously. I'm, I'm just saying uh, the students here are, are really amazing at, at finding, at diagnosing these problems and getting them to work. Um, it's still really fiddly. I feel like, you know, we're still in the dark ages of understanding what's happening when we're training neural networks or building models, even in, yeah. So. Is that something that you're uh, focused on from a research perspective? Yeah. So actually, one of the other ICML submissions we published yesterday, or we didn't publish, we submitted yesterday, was a collaboration with Philip Hennig trying to automate the step size selection during training. And the idea is that we said, oh, well, right now when we run stochastic gradient descent, we just, we, you know, if we have momentum or we do atom, we kind of have a little bit of averaging of the previous gradients. 
but we actually know how to combine noisy observations of different things in like perfectly well in principle with common filters. And this is just like a simple latent variable linear Gaussian model. And so Phil and his student Lucas were saying, oh yeah, and one cool thing that we can do now that we couldn't do at least for modern autodiff systems is get cheap Hessian vector products and get them for every example in a mini batch. Anyway, I'm getting into the weeds here, but the point is we can look at all the statistics of the gradients within a mini batch that, that are, we're observing, put that in a really cheap and scalable model. And now when we're trying to choose which direction to go and uh, how far to go, we have a lot more information available than normal. So uh, our step size can trade off. You can say, okay, well, I know I'm, I'm this certain about the gradient, and, but I also think there's curvature in this direction. I also think there's, you know, um, I'm uncertain about the curvature. Um, I think my future gradient observations are going to have this much noise. You can trade off all those things to ask like what uh, direction and how far would give me the greatest expected improvement or probability of improvement or whatever else you want. Mm -hmm. So we kind of hope that- Is it fair to characterize this as using a, uh, using a model within the machine learning training process yeah. in a place that you would otherwise kind of hard code uh, hard code a, a parameter like step size or do like cyclical yep. step, step sizes or something like that? You got it, exactly. And we just took a lot of care to make sure though that the, there was no inner training loop. Like we don't have to train this model. All the updates are closed form. So the mm -hmm. algorithm looks like something like Atom where it's just a bunch of vectorized operations that don't have any training loops. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the hope is that using this extra information or this information that was always available but we don't really use it, we can design optimizers that at least always make progress. Uh, maybe they, you know, some fancy tuned hyperparameter schedule will be able to do better in principle. But if you could say, I'm just going to run my optimizer for a really long time and it's never going to stop uh, because the learning rate was stuck at being too high or too low. I hope we, you know, uh, we hope that that will make this sort of engineering struggle that every deep learning student faces all day, every day, at least have one less hyperparameter. Uh, and, you know, and it's a pretty important hyperparameter. Is there a way to combine this with uh, you know other methods that have been worked out that you know it sounds like what you are fundamentally trying to solve or at least the result you presented is that you're less likely to get stuck in some kind of local optima? Is it also possible to to combine this with you know some kind of you know acceleration or momentum or something like that so that you can both converge faster and not get stuck in a optima? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's sort of where we left the research, or that's how, that's how far we've gotten um, so far, is that we got this method to work, we got the step size to work. But funnily enough, we kind of found that it converges a little too well, or rather that, so we have this one experiment where if we just run our automatic step size selection, it makes a lot of progress really early, and it ends up getting in stuck in a local optimum, which is normally not really okay, a big problem. I thought, that's what you, I thought that was the... Uh the opposite of what it was doing by the way you described uh, that, well, you know, what it really does well is, you know, eventually converge. Yeah. Well, exactly. Well, when we say converge though, it, you know, we can only talk, we only can guarantee local convergence. Um, so these heuristics for saying, Oh, what maximize my probability of improvement or expected improvement that only looks one step ahead. Yeah. In principle, we, we do need to somehow look ahead, uh, like multiple steps ahead, mm -hmm. but in practice, that's just always going to be really hard. Um, it's mm -hmm. like as hard as actually solving the original problem. Um, so, you know, we had some reason to believe that this might, or to expect that this might be a problem. There's like Roger Gross, my colleague here, has some nice work on the short horizon bias, basically saying, if you optimize to do one well one step ahead, you'll, you won't make good long-term progress. So the thing is that there's also reason to believe that this wouldn't be a problem because we think that the local optima that we, in training deep nets, isn't such a big problem. So, you know, we're not totally sure if these are actually local optima or just places where the optimizer can't make progress. Um, but we we did find that if we run for a fixed step size for a while and then switch to our adaptive step size, that works the best. So it's one of these things where we did get this thing to work better, but because it's myopic, like it only looks a few steps ahead. If you have a really long computational budget, just using step size, fixed, size, fixed step sizes for a while and then switching works best. And so that's an unsatisfying answer. So I think that's the remaining question to get this to be really mm -hmm. practical is... It could be that if we just run this adaptive thing for long enough, it will be able to escape these local optima. We haven't really looked into this in depth yet. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that you uh, identified the the weakness in this whole story, uh, just, just guessing it. 
you know, maybe taking a step back, you know, there's kind of a lot of contemporary debate around, you know, the role that deep learning plays in uh, artificial intelligence, moving us to AGI. What what kind of motivates you and where do you see this all going? Right. So as I said, I think from a practical point of view in the short term, just being able to meet the data where it is and uh, deal with the actual huge piles of real problems and data sets that can't even really be touched by standard deep learning or at least supervised deep learning or discrete time series models. That's like a huge area of low hanging fruit. And there's a ton of people who are just saying, oh, you know, I was promised that AI would revolutionize my industry, but it's still kind of very bespoke and only can be applied here or there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but yeah, that's sort of partly why I'm also spending a lot of time thinking more about these amortized search and planning um, algorithms, because I do think also that we are about to have a big improvement in the sort of general reasoning abilities of machines. And I think this is still going to be like mostly toy demos for a few years. And do you think that that mostly comes from a reinforcement learning type of problem formulation? Oh, or? Well, the thing is that reinforcement learning is such a vague word. And I guess I'll say sure. model free <laughs> reinforcement learning, you know, has it's like now no one's excited about it and everyone was super hyped about it like, you know, three or four or even two years ago. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I would say right like model based planning or model based control is mm -hmm. really starting to become practical now for the first time. Um, I think a lot of people have said, you know, been believing in this for 40 years. There's this amazing book by Bert Sikas, Neuro Linguistic Programming, that basically outlines most of the methods that people are excited about today. And I think it's from like the 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's just that we now have a pile of, or a set of tools that we have an idea of how to combine. We're starting to understand how they can be scaled up. Uh, so what I hear you saying is that you're mostly not placing bets on this kind of, you know, what's going to get us to AGI kind of question. And you're focused on like, you know, how we can use this technology to solve current problems. Well, no, I, I guess I would say <laughs> working backwards from what gets us to AGI is a, f is a really fun research agenda, right? And I love all the papers uh -huh. like the Google machine. And there's recent work on logical inductors um, that mm -hmm. try to sort of sketch out what these would look like. And then they always have a part where it's like, and now you do a search over all possible programs or something like that, which we don't know how to do. <laughs> but I love the idea of right. working backwards from there. And I guess I'll just say, we also have a huge amount of low hanging fruit, like strong gradients saying, oh, if we combine these two tools that we have, we can figure out how to do that. We, we know we'll have a big step towards more general reasoning capabilities. So I think we, we don't even have to, we shouldn't be thinking hard, but for the near future, I think we can make a bunch of progress without even thinking that hard about the long term. Well, David, thanks so much for taking the time to update me on what you're up to and, and you know, generally share with, with all of us uh, what you're working on you know, at your lab and with your students. Uh, looking forward to catching your ICML papers. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Sam. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on today's show, visit twimlai.com slash shows. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.